Welcome everybody to the Modulai course. So today starts, if you want, the fun part of this course. We will draw pictures of phylogenetic trees. We will look at points moving in on the projective line. And we do a <clears throat> quite a bit of concrete examples. I hope you can hear me and see me. Otherwise, please give sign through the chats. So the program for today will be the construction of M0N and of its compactification M0N bar. So we will not <coughs> achieve everything today because I want to go slowly so that we can enjoy it, but at least uh, we will give some examples, concrete situations where we know what to do. Okay, so let me recall the setting which we have. So we always work over K arbitrary field, but you could you could think of K equals R or C if you want. Doesn't matter so much, and uh, we have. P1 plus P1K, the projective line over K. So I will identify this often with K union, a symbol which is infinity, as we already did, and then the rules of addition and uh, multiplication of the obvious ones this obvious algebraic operations. Okay, <clears throat> Obvious in the sense, how do we treat infinity? So on this projective line, we now choose n points, choose n points, x1, xn, in P1 and we let x be the n tuple of these points, so in P1 to the n. And whenever we have such an n tuple of points in P1, we will call it <coughs> x is an n tuple or an n gun in P1. That's how we talk about it. And of course, if you are with the complex numbers, you can draw these points. And then you think, of course, of this five gun. OK? But over arbitrary fields, it looks different, of course. So for the moment, our points our, so the xi will be called the entries, xi. We need a little bit of terminology, entry of x at index i. And we will need later a set of indices, which I call 1 up to n, but it could be an arbitrary set with n elements. And this set will be called the set of labels. Okay, so the indices are the labels of the of the n gun. Now, to start with, we will only consider n guns where the x i are pairwise distinct. To start, x i should be pairwise distinct xi different xj for all i different j. So I will keep my notation. i, j, k, l will always be the indices. x will always be an n gun. And <clears throat> to make this a little bit formal, we define the big diagonal, p 
pick diagonal. So these are the x in P1 and xi equals xj for some i different j. So we will delete this big diagonal from P1 to the end. So let me call this script un P1 n minus delta n. And inside we will have n gons which pairwise distinct entries and gone with pairwise distinct entries xi. Now, of course, <coughs> PGL2, as we have seen several times, acts on P1. PGL2 acts on P1. Let me, for completeness, repeat how it works. So I see something in the chat, maybe there's a problem, just let me see. I misspelled. A misprint. Here, yes, that's a, obviously a misprint, but that's just to keep you attentive. Sorry. Same. Thank you. <clears throat> You can speak it out loud if you want. It's not a problem. It may be easier because I, I don't even see, don't always see the chat. X on P1. We already had this, so we had A equals A, B, C, D. In PGL2, let me just repeat. And Z is a variable. Then we get the rational function AZ or AZ, AZ plus b, c, z, plus d. And that's what we call a Möbius transformation. Of course, we did this already, but I want to, to have it kind of a, give you a, the whole setting again. So, of course, as PGL2 acts on P1, it also acts on n gods. Hence, PGL2 over the field acts on P1 to the n, just acting on each xi. And of course, whenever you have two distinct entries xi, xj, the images on the PGL2 will also be distinct because that's an automorphism. So it acts not only on this one and also on un. Okay. So that's our first moduli space, M0n. We have the same notation as Delin, Mumford, and Knudsen are using. So that's, I have problems to write my u. So un mod pgl2. So let me write it again, p1 to the n minus delta n mod PGL2. So that's now just as a set. Yeah? This is a set of, of orbits. Set of PGL2 orbits of n-gons in UN. We don't have yet an algebraic structure on it, yeah? or an analytic as a manifold or something like this just as a set. Okay. So what we want to do, we want to see this as an algebraic variety, and we also want to compactify it. So there are more comments in the chats. Let me just check. Ah, the microphone. Is it better now? I hope yes. it... Sorry for this, but... Yeah, uh, thank you for pointing it out. 
There are so many things I have to, you don't see what I'm doing with my feet while I'm talking here. No? It's like playing piano. Some of you know to play piano very well, I know. So that's as I said. So the goal is understand <clears throat> M0n as an algebraic variety. So in a suitable sense, and construct, let me call it a reasonable compactification. M0 n bar of it. So this should be a moduli space. It should be, again, a moduli space for certain objects, certain equivalence classes of objects. I will make this statement much more precise in the course but uh, just to give you again the idea. No? So <clears throat> seeing it as an algebraic variety means to define M0n in some space by equations. Yeah? But it could be also inequalities and inequalities because it will not be a closed subvariety of some space. Okay? So today, we will talk only a little bit about the compactification and about limits. We will start with this M0n. So uh, the idea is to embed this un in a big projective space. I think I still have space to write here. So let me write here the idea. And I learned this idea from Josef Schicho. But apparently, I mean, many, <laughs> many ideas in mathematics appear again and again. So this also is in a paper of Gerritsen, Herrlich, and Van der Putt. So this paper, I will, it's in the, lab, in the bibliography. In essence, it makes the, the same construction, but I find it kind of hard to read. So there's again something in the chat. So what should I do? Uh, you can pin the video so that it does not switch if someone else um, makes. Not nothing. I, I just think that some people had the issue that someone else made a sound and then the video switched from the, the live board to that person's face. Ah, that yeah. But I think people. I think everybody is muted, so it should be okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So the idea is embed UN. in a natural way, and natural means, in, so in my classes, natural always means without using the axiom of choice. Do you understand? Without using the axiom of choice, which means that you don't prefer something, you just do it very naturally, in a natural way, into a big projective space. And this embedding will be so nice that it passes on to M0n, inducing, and now I'm running out of space, inducing, maybe I can write here, excuse me, an embedding of 
M zero M. Sorry, uh, uh, Erwin. Yes. This is, not the, this is not the sacral embedding. It's it's a different one. Yes, it's a different one, and I will do it in a minute. Okay. Uh, so what I want to do today and also next week is to go first very slowly and to try to motivate the ideas. And the, the objective is that afterward you say, ah, but I could have invented this myself. It's so easy. Why didn't I do it? Yeah, that's always a good criterion whether you have understood uh, a theory. So before going into this, I need a little bit more of terminology. So there I am. So we will <coughs> we rec recall that the action of PGL2 on P1 is sharply retransitive. So when we have an n gone, hence, if we have x equals x1, xn, and I'm still in un, un always means pairwise distinct entries, then x is equivalent is equivalent to y to an ang on y which starts with 0 1 infinity and then y4 up to yn again in un but if i choose this y i choose the axiom of choice of course i am kidding but you choose something because you say I prefer the first three entries of my n-gon. So this would be entry 1, 2, 3. But of course, you could choose any other triple of numbers. So that brings us to a set which I want to write like this. This is a set of triples, t equals i, j, k. Now, this will be ordered. So these are i, j, k in n. So these are ordered increasingly ordered triples in our label set n, which is, I recall, this was 1 up to n. I don't want to write this 1 up to n because we will work abstractly with any finite set. So this is a set of triples, which I mostly write i, j, k. And then we can do the following. Given x in p in u, n, and t in n to 3, there exists a unique by the sharp 3 transitivity of our y of our action y in un, y i equals 0, y to so this t here will be i j k, okay, y j equals 1, and y k equals infinity. And of course, this y will be pgl2 equivalent to x. So as it is unique, we will give it a name. We call this y uh, you should never have two mathematical symbols in a row by the name. That's not a good English, but excuse me, xt. Now I write upper t to indicate the triple. Okay? It's unique. OK. So actually, one can compute when con one can compute 
these uh, entries of xt. So xt will again have uh, that's an n gon, so it is xt1, xt2. Now, of course, the notation is a little bit heavy, but we cannot avoid it in p1n. And uh, we can compute the else entry. XTL will be YL, the else entry of our unique element here. And if you compute, this will be the cross ratio YL 1, 0, infinity. Because this will give you YL minus 0 times 1 minus infinity. Uh, now we have YL minus infinity and 1 minus 0. So the YL is in K. So it is in P1, but it is distinct from 0, 1, and infinity because uh, it's in UN. Y is in UN. So here, this, of course, YL minus infinity is in minus infinity because YL is finite. So these two cancel. And we are left with YL. Yes? No, nothing. But this here, this is just a papa one, y i, this one is y j, and this one is y k. Okay. So what does this mean? We can express the entries of this x t by cross ratios. Hence, the entries of xt equals y are cross ratios. But here, this cross ratio yl, yj, yi, yk, it is the same as the cross ratio of x because they are both are equivalent and the cross ratio is invariant under PGL2. So we get that uh, now maybe I write it like this. We get if we take this XTL, it is the cross ratio. We replace now this by take care whether I write an upper T or not. So we have XL. Then we have xj, xi, xk. So we can express our xt directly in terms of cross ratios of our x. This is a, I will denote this as cross q of x. Where now q is a quadruple, and here I have to order as follows l, j, i, k. So I don't care about the ordering so much, because if you permute the entries of the cross ratio, you just get one of these fractions, which I discussed already. So the xt is completely determined by x and the cross ratios of x. Okay. So let me write this down.
Okay, where am I? So <clears throat> together, let me write it down again. For each x in un and t in n over 3, we get a unique, the formula does not matter so much, a unique n gon xt, which is equivalent to x, whose entries are determined by cross ratios of x. Okay. That's the upshot. And the cross ratios, recall, are always taken with respect to quadruples. With respect to quadruples. And now I write them in the usual order, i, j, k, n. So what is a quadruple? I need a different notation, because in the quadruples, the order will play a role, and it need not be increasingly ordered. So the set of quadruples, I will write them n up of 4. This is i, j, k, l in n to the 4. And the only condition is that they are pairwise distinct. Pairwise distinct labels. So it's not, it's a little bit different because here these are now ordered but not increasingly ordered. Four tuples. Is this clear? I think it's not so complicated. Okay. So now we are well prepared. Uh, recall something I already did. If Q is in N4 and we permute the entries, yeah, Q U prime a permutation of let me call the entries of the quadruples labels of labels of Q, then the cross ratio with respect to Q prime of some x, if you denote this by lambda, no, let me do it like this. If you don't need it as a lambda, then the cross ratio of the permutation Q prime of x belongs to lambda. What was the, now I hope to make it complete, 1 over lambda, 1 over 1 minus lambda, 1 minus lambda, lambda over 1 minus lambda, and 1 minus lambda over lambda, lambda. OK? It's one of these. And we can identify them if we want, because it doesn't make a big difference. OK? You are all set over there? So now. Sign. Should be with opposite sign. Here? Yeah, I think so. Let me write plus minus too. I don't want <laughs> Okay. Is that the, it's always the same problem. Yeah. I, I Apparently, I, it's the third time that I make maybe mistakes here, but uh, you understand what I mean. Okay. So now we have a criterion to check whether two n-gons are equivalent. Remark, for now you see, the machine, once you have this bit of terminology, the machine will work automatically. For x, y, we have still have pairwise distinct entries. We have 
x is equivalent to y with respect to pgl2 if and only if xt equals yt for all t in n over 3. Yeah, because the xt is a distinguished representative of the equivalence class. Yeah? But it depends on t. Okay. So now we put this together. And I have to, yeah, now I need much more blackboard, so I have to erase again. So let me call this uh, xt is a distinguished representative of the orbit x of x. So this is PGL2 of x. And maybe somebody is thinking of that you don't need all t here. You just need one t here. xt equals yt for some t in n over 3. Yeah. So now we will define already the embedding. We embed un into a projective space. And this goes as follows. So this, let me formulate it as a proposition. <clears throat> so I wrote this equivalence here. Now the orbits are characterized by the normal form. And if you take some t, then you have to specify which t you take. But if you take all, then this is again natural. Okay? So that's a good candidate. And that's what we do. We call it the some symmetrization map. Sigma n. It goes from un, and recall this was p1 to the n minus delta n. It will go to p1 to the n to the n over 3. So n over 3 is a number of triples. Okay? So this is, of course, p1 n times n over 3. You cannot avoid it. And how do you do it? You take x equals x1 xn, and we just send it to xt, t in n over 3. So we take all normal forms of x with respect to all triples. That's clearly injective. Okay. And as the entries of xt are cross ratios in the entries of x, this is an algebraic morphism is an injective algebraic morphism. And this just means the entries here of the xt are rational functions of the xi's. Rational functions, OK? Well-defined rational functions is an injective algebraic morphism and induces now by our remark from before if we take an equivalent 
n gone. Why here? It goes to the same. It goes to the same image, and induces an injective map. Now it's just a map because we have a set. Now I call this xi n from m zero n, which was u n mod p g l two, injective into this p one n times n over three, and we have of course the commutative diagram. If we have here u n. Here we have sigma n, the symmetrization map, and this is just a canonical projection going, sending x to its orbit. I denote orbits by brackets. Okay. So this one will go to x t t in n over three. I hope you can read. Nothing to prove. We did it already. Okay. Uh, proof already done. And now you see that that's nice because it does not depend on the choice of our triples t. We just take all of them. So the image of this m0n is of course the same as the image of un and we'll get a separate name we set vn sigma n of un which is also xi n of m0n inside this projective space p1 n times n over 3. And now my pen is running out of liquid. I, had, I was giving a class before, and I already had the problem. And I was happy to find this one, this pen. But it seems that it doesn't work anymore either. So now, yes? Slightly technical question. Um, this map um, sigma n, um, it, I think it's not quite constant on the orbit, because when you take a different representative, you get a different ordering on the, on the resulting thing on the right-hand side. Because, for example, if you replace x by xt, then all the triples change in order on the right side, so you can just uh, send Ah, uh, yeah. I, I, I think it's not an issue, but... Paul, you are right. You are right. Uh, up to permutations. No, it, it makes this code uh, that the 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 Yes. Uh, so let me put here a star. And let us just write this up to permutations of entries. Is this OK like this? I think so, yes. It's not a big issue, as you say. But it, to be precise, one has to take care of it. Yeah, you, one is allowed to, if you permute here the entries, then this would also change this. OK. So this Vn now is inside p1 n to the n over 3. And so that's something which is called uh, a quasi-projective variety. Is quasi-projective sub-variety. We will see it later on. This means that it is given by equations and uh, by inequations, okay? because it's, it's not closed here inside. Yeah? So 
I think I don't make a break here because I want to do the examples because they are a lot of fun and I hope that you enjoy. So, and we will come back to this proposition, which is of course the, the key for the whole business we are going to do. So one thing which is quite clear at this point already, if you want to compactify M0n, you just compactify Vn inside here by taking the topological closure or the Zarevsky closure. Okay. So <clears throat> there is one other point which is kind of strange. Maybe I should emphasize this, but let me just try here. So one more remark, but I don't write it down. So un is a set of n-gons, but m0n is a set of equivalence classes. Okay. So this is our candidate for our moduli space for un modulo pgl2. Okay. Now vn, vn has no longer any equivalence relations. Yeah. It's just a subset inside here. Of points, yeah. So, if V n is a moduli space, we don't know yet of what because the equivalence relation has disappeared. Yeah, we just have a, a set which we can make into a quasi-projective algebraic variety. Okay, but that's not a that's not a problem. It simplifies things, but it's almost too simple. Okay. So the elements inside here, they will get a proper name. So I will write them bold phase x, and we call them strings. These are strings of n-gons. And so it's a, it's a very long list. Yeah. And we write them as xt t in n over 3. So watch out. Now I am just in an arbitrary point here. But again, as we are in n over 3, I can, I can group them. So each xt here is in p1 to the n. So maybe I should make this more precise. Yeah. So x is a very long vector. We will see it in a minute. We write it as a vector of vectors, t in n over 3. And xt is an n-gon, which will consist of xt1 up to xtn. This is in p1 to the n, an n-gon. So a string, a string x is, if you want, a vector of n-gons. It sounds a little bit complicated, but it's just a matter of bookkeeping. There's nothing mathematical deep behind. So let us jump into examples. Can I just do a question before we go into the examples? And yes, Chiara? Maybe, uh, maybe this is because you said that the equivalence relation disappears. Maybe, maybe it's just because I'm a bit tired that I think this is really easy, but. Uh, what if we consider um, two elements of Vn equivalent if they are the same up to permutations of entries? Because that would solve the problem and it would give us an equivalence relation. Yes, you're right. You're, Does that work? You're 100% right, but it's just a wet matter of, of terminology or language because first, looking up to permutation is maybe not so interesting. When you hear you have to do it, but if you say I classify things up to permutation, yeah, OK. The second thing is, even if you don't take here an equivalence relation, you can always say, say I take the trivial equivalence relation. Yeah? And then, yeah, but maybe I will think about it. Maybe to take it up to permutations is a good way out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not the 
it's not the substance of the problem, of course. The, the, the interesting substance is to compactify, yeah? to compactify this and to see what's going on. OK, Chiara, thank you. So let's do n equals 3. That's, of course, a kind of uh, stupid uh, situation, but at least to practice a little bit. So our n gon will have three entries, x2, x3, x3, in u3. And we just have one triple. t is 1, 2, 3. In, I write it like this, so, yeah, n over 3, unique triple. There's no choice. And then the xt. Now these x1, x2, x3 are pairwise distinct. So the normal form is just 0, 1, infinity. OK, and we are done. So <clears throat> m03 is just one point. There's one orbit. Yeah. That's not so, not so interesting. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to compactify. So it would be a zero dimensional model S space. So n equals 4 is already a little bit more, I mean, quite interesting, actually. So now we have our foregon. x will be x1, x2, x3, x4. We agree in u4. And now we have already several triples. t could be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 1, 3, 4, or 2, 3, 4 in n over 3. We have four triples. So <clears throat> how will our x, so x will be sent to the string x, which is, maybe I should, I didn't put a name here. This will be xt, t in n over 3. And if you want, you could also take here the orbit from the very beginning. I don't care. Up to permutation, as we said. So how does this look like? So we start with, now we have, I take the triples in this order. So the first one will be 0, 1, infinity, and some a. So this corresponds to the triple 1, 2, 3. The next one, which is 1, 2, 4, will have 0, 1, b, infinity. Then we have 1, 3, 4 will be 0, c, 1, infinity. And the last one corresponding to 2, 3, 4, will be d, 0, 1, infinity. But of course, a, b, c, d will not be arbitrary. They will be related. So where a, b, c, d, they are different from 0, 1, infinity. So they are in p1 minus 0, 1, infinity are related. And now you see how you argue. <clears throat> so either you compute the orbits of each of them, but what is much easier is you just take, uh, you, you profit of knowing that they have the same cross ratio uh, related by xt and xs having now as we have four guns, we just have one cross ratio, xt and xs having the same cross ratio with respect to the quadruple. Quadruples will always be q, 1, 2, 3, 4. So exercise, I think uh, you may want to do the exercise to get a little bit of practice. Uh, we get b is 1 minus a up to computational error. c is 1, 1 minus a. 
and d is 1 over a. Okay. So that's our image. So what does this tell us? We have one freedom, which is a. The other ones are prescribed by a. And m, m04, now a is allowed to move in p1, 0, 1, and infinity. So this will be isomorphic as a set to p1 minus 0, 1, infinity. And this is, of course, an open subset of p1. Okay. And one thing I want to emphasize that these four foregones are PGL2 equivalent to each other. Yeah? I write it down because we will lose this property when we pass to the compactification. Note the four foregones are PGL2 equivalent to each other. Obvious, but we write it down because we will compare it later when this does not hold anymore. So before going to n equals 5, I want to compactify already now. So compactification means taking limits. And we have seen this in a small example already earlier, I think two weeks ago or something like this. But I want to do it now in this example uh, completely to see what is now a possible limit. So recall that our our string here, this lives now in this where we are in p1 to the n times n over 3. So we know what our limits. We are now in a topological space. This was my pen. Yeah. So the big question is, and that's the interesting question, uh, Vn lies now I, I formulated it for arbitrary n, but if I do it for n equals four, n times n over three inherits. Now, if, of course, if I say a topology, I always think of the field of complex numbers and uh, the topology on the complex numbers. So there's something in the chat again. I cannot read all this, but uh, I, will, I will look it up afterwards. Inherits the topology. of projective space. So for those who are not so familiar with algebraic geometry, think of the real numbers and the projective space p1 to the n, n over 3 uh, with the Euclidean topology. But most of you are familiar with algebraic geometry, so you would take the Zariski topology if you have an arbitrary field. But we don't need this. We just, we just look at these here, and we let A, B, A, B, C, and D move. So the question is, what happens if A goes to 0, 1, infinity? Yeah? Inside, inside. So that's easy. I will write it like this. Limit of x 
And of course, this x now depends on a, so I should write an x of a, but I don't want to. So I write it like this. a goes to, what do I have? I think I have taken infinity. So here we have it. So we just plug it in. We get again a string. And this is now 0, 1, infinity, infinity. The next one is 0, 1. And now the b, the b is 1 minus a. That's not OK. It should be a minus 1. Come on. I think it should be a minus 1. Otherwise, I have a problem. Sorry for that. I did the computation. I will, I will send it by mail the correct. In any case, you get here infinity and infinity. I don't, yeah, minus infinity. Minus infinity is the same. Sorry. Minus infinity is the same as plus infinity, of course. Sorry. Now here, in the third one, c is 1 divided by 1 minus a, so this gives 0. 0, 0, 1, infinity. And the last one will be uh, 0, 0, 1, infinity. This is a string, the limit string. So this corresponds again to 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 1, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4. Now we have equality of entries. Equality of entries occurs. Well, that's a certain problem. But of course, these four foregones will still have the same cross ratios. Equality of cross ratios persists because we have taken a continuous limit by continuity. But if you have looked at the last class, or maybe the second to last class, then you will remember that among these four foregones, not all are PGL2 equivalent to each other. Yeah. Of course, the first two are equal, so we have x1, 2, 3 equals x1, 2, 4. And we have x1, 3, 4 equals x2, 3, 4. But if we compare these two, they cannot be equivalent. Yeah, because they would have equality at the same place. No? They are not equivalent. So we get two different orbits. So the four foregones of x define two distinct orbits. So this, hap this was uh, for a going to infinity, but the same happens with 0 and 1. So all together, m0n bar, the compactification, so what we, the limits we add, so I write this like this as a set theoretic difference, all together will consist of six points consist of six, bound, that's the naming is boundary strings. What am I saying? Not boundary <coughs> orbits. Hmm? 
Okay. Here we have them. So let me now draw a graph. Let us draw a graph. And I do it just without explaining. So if we have x in un, u4, and foregone with so now I have a lot of messages in the chat, so maybe I should look it up. Oh, there's a discussion about the permutations. OK, I will, I will read this afterwards. So if x is in u4, so if we have pairwise distinct entries, we just get one orbit, one orbit x. And four pairwise distinct entries xi. So <clears throat> let me draw this like this. For the orbit, I draw a dot. And for the labels of the distinct entries, I draw for leaves, and I add the indices I, 1, 2, 3, 4. So these are the four indices we have here. And what is the meaning of all this? So this here corresponds to x. So this will be a vertex of our graph. This is an inner vertex. with four leaves. And the leaves are elements of n, which in this case is just 1, 2, 3, and 4. So that's just a way to codify how many entries are distinct in x. Now, if x is one of these limits, so Again, I have to. This cleaning is a little bit embarrassing. So, what would be the picture of the graphical presentation of such a limit? So, maybe I should be a little bit more precise here. Let me explain. Excuse me, I did not hear anything because of the machine. What did you say? Basically, that, that, that you identify like pairs of points so that you get something that looks like, like two, two times as one. Uh, yeah, connected Yes, I will draw it in a moment correctly. So what I want to add here before is uh, the string x, which I associate to x, uh, defines one orbit x. Okay, because all the n-gons of the string are equivalent to each other. So that, yeah. So the x is in u4, and x will be in v4. Now let us take, this was the, the first case, 1. The second case will now be, we take a string. I take directly a string in the closure minus v4 as before. So this is now such an element. We will have two orbits. Yeah. X. I, the terminology is x has two orbits. So what do I mean by this? That in this string, we have 
this is the same orbit, and this here is the other orbit. Okay, among the many the many n-gons you have, some are equivalent, some are not, and here you have two different orbits, and we draw this v is x bum bum one two three. I hope you can read this, which is the same as x, 1, 2, 4. We have the same orbit. I'm sorry for this. It's not. We draw an edge, and we have w, which is x, uh, 1, 3, 4, which is the same as x, 2, 3, 4. And now we attach again leaves to this object, to this edge. So V, which is this one, it has entry 1 and 2 singletons. Yeah? X1 and X2 is different to all others. So we draw them here. We draw the indices 1 and 2. Now we call X1 and x2 are singletons of this n-gon in the sense that they are different from all other entries. Okay. Whereas entry 3 and 4 are equal, so we draw them here, 3 and 4. So what does this now mean? <clears throat> I did this for v. V has three edges starting at V, this vertex. So it means that whatever you get when you go along one edge, you will get same entries. So here, two is alone, one is alone, but these three, x3 and x4, are equal. And the situation is symmetric with respect to W. In W, which is this one here or this one here, three and four are distinct. And 1 and 2, which are at the end of this edge, are the same. So how is the rule to read this graph? If you go from a vertex directly to a leaf, okay, then this means that the entry corresponding to this label here is a singleton. Yeah? Let me write this down. Singleton entry of, now I can call it of w, which means distinct from all other entries. Okay. As is x4. These here. Imagine that you have a train station here, and there are three rails going from this train station. Now, if you start, let's say, going from Vienna to Hamburg, and then you go on, then you have to take the first portion of your travel is the same. So these two will give the same entry for W. Okay, That's the rule. So. Uh, this is just one way where we did a. We took the limit of a as a goes to infinity, but here we get two other such pictures because of the change of the labels. So the next one would be, it always looks like this. But the labels are distributed differently. It would be 1, 3, 2, 4, and 1, 4, 2, 3. So that's a combinatorial codification of the structure of such a string. Okay. Again, we have here. V, W, V, W. 
So what is the upshot? Uh, we can see how many points we will add to M0n going to the closure. Okay. So there is a relation between these graphs, which is very simple. So the remark is taking one of these trees, these are trees, of course, combinatorial trees. This tree degenerates to this one when you collapse the unique edge. So let me call this here A, B, C. So for instance, case 2A degenerates to case 1 by collapsing the unique edge. So we will see later on that there is a precise rule how limit points have a relation with respect to their graphs. Okay. So I did not explain exactly how we find such a graph. We just did it in this example. And uh, I don't want to do it. Uh, I don't want to give you the general rule today. I want to go to example n equals 5, which is still a little bit more interesting. I'm not going to do it completely, but at least I will give you the first few steps. So for n equals 4, we only add in the compactification finitely many points. For larger n, for larger n, we will have to add much more in the limit. Not just finitely many points, but higher dimensional objects. So let me talk a little bit if my pen still works. Example n equals 5. That's the first interesting case. Isn't the case when n equals 4, the closure is just a projected line, isn't it? Isn't isomorphic to the projected line? Yes, I think so. I think so. So this is a three point zero one infinity that you, you missed in, on the projected line, basically. It depends where you close it up. Yeah, that's that's a subtle thing. Yeah, we we will see this later on. Uh, we close it up in the embedding. Okay, so I will come back to this, Jose. Okay, so now we have x equals x one, x two, x three x4, x5. Again, we start with pairwise distinct entries. And now we have 5 over 3 equals 10 triples t i j k in n over 3. So of course, I'm not going to write down all of them. So we have. As all, if all are pairwise distinct, we get, let me call it the generic string. Generic means that we start with an n gone, a 5 gone, with pairwise distinct entries. It will look like this. So I just write the beginning 0, 1, infinity, a, b. This will correspond to the triple 1, 2, 3. The next one will be 1, 2, 4. So we will have 0, 1, then some a prime, then infinity b prime. The next one will be 1, 2, 5. So it will be 0, 1, a double prime, b double prime, infinity, 1, 2, 5, and so on. 
you have 10 n gons and 10 5 gons, pentagons if you want. Okay? And again, the A, B, A prime, B prime, A double prime, B prime, B prime are related to each other. Where A, A prime, and so on are related to each other by the equality, equalities of cross ratios. Can you still read this? Maybe I switch to yellow. So <clears throat> it's easy to see that the dimension of M05, which is the dimension of V5, will be n minus 3 equals 2. <clears throat> so now let me take again limits. That's the interesting thing. What about limits? And of course, I cannot do it in full detail, but let me do it just for this first n gone. So start with 0, 1, infinity, a, b. So here we have a different from b in the generic case, and a, b are in p1 and different from 0, 1, and infinity. OK. So now what? What are the possible limits? And you see, now you have various options. Three options can occur. The first one is that in the limit, I don't want to say where we go. I just want to uh, three options of equality of entries, of equalities between entries. You see, if you do this uh, for the five guns, it's already a little bit complicated. So one thing could, which could happen is that two entries are the same in the limit. Precisely two entries equal. The second option is that precisely two pairs of two entries are equal. And the third option is that precisely three entries are equal. Now you may wonder, couldn't it happen that three entries become equal and the other two become equal? But that's not allowed because we always want to have at least three distinct entries. Always at least three distinct entries required. So that's, of course, just the combinatorial information about equality. But for these, we can draw again a graph. And with this, I will conclude for today. And you will see that there is a principle behind which we will want to disclose in the next lectures. So I just draw the graphs, and I let it up to you to find out why this makes sense. And then, of course, next week we will explain.
So, of course, things are a little bit more complicated, but I will draw you at least some graphs. And be, please apologize that I don't do everything today at the same time, because that's too much. So the generic case will have five leaves, one, two, three, four. Five, and this is V, which is the orbit. So this is <coughs> of one and five gone. This is the generic case X in V five. So now here we can have the following situations. We will have a string x with two orbits, v and w. So this may be correspond to some x t. I hope I don't confuse you too much. This corresponds to a different orbit. So <clears throat> these xt and xs belong to string x in the boundary. Okay. And uh, I think I just draw the I just draw the, the graph and I let you find out what they mean. One, two, three, four, five. And there is one more example which has two edges. u, v, w. Now you have three orbits corresponding maybe to xt, xs, and xr. These are, again, five gons of a string like this. And the leaves are distributed like this. Here you have two leaves. Here you just have one. And here you have, again, two. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So what does this mean? So these are now the phylogenetic trees. This means the following. <coughs> if you choose for v, for this orbit here, 1 xt, it will have singletons at place 1 and index 2. And the other three are equal. OK, so that's the case where precisely three entries are equal. That's the case three here. OK, if you look at w, it will have three singletons. So the three entries corresponding to these indices are distinct from all the others. And these two are equal. So this corresponds to this situation, one. And uh, yeah, and here, now, now I hope you see what's going on. So this one will have entry 1 and entry 2 distinct to all others. They are singletons. And 3, 4, 5, the entries will be the same. So that's again this situation. This w is symmetric, but this v here 
this v here is the remaining case because this v have will just have one entry which is distinct to all others. That's the singleton of v, v3 if you want. And they are two equal because they are in the same exit here. And if you exit from this side, these two will be equal. So v here, v will correspond to case 2. And uh, u, what was u? u was 3 equal. So this was case 3. And w was the same. And here, v will correspond to case 1, no? You said 1? Yes. And the same for w. So you see that this graphical presentation contains some information about equality of entries of our n-gons. Yeah? And of course, the, the message, the take-home message for today will be this works in general. You can associate to any such string x, where is my x? My bold phase x. Here is my bold phase x. You can associate such a phylogenetic tree, and it codifies completely equality. And there's a rule how to construct these trees. Okay. I hope that this was not too confusing. I will come back to this to next week. But at least you should see a little bit the flavor where we are going. And the point of the whole construction is that first we get the compactification for free as the closure of Vn in this projective high dimensional space. And second, we get information about the strings which belong to Vn or v, the closure of Vn through this phylogenetic trees. Okay. So <clears throat> thank you very much for your interest and uh, patience with me. And I hope to see you again next week. So there were many messages in the chats. There was even a discussion. So I cannot read the chat easily. And when I close the, the Zoom session, they disappear. So maybe those who wrote uh, interesting comments in the chat can send them to me by mail. And then I can reflect on them and talk about them next week. So please take a minute to write an email and to send me this. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening and see you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Deja. Thank you.